number of within group variables, that's what counts as repeated measures, remember? Good, good, we should start getting a lot of these right. Okay, so where are we? We're going to finish up on logistic to re uh, receive operating characteristic curves. Um, do something on uh, discriminant analysis. I'll try and see how much that would get in. We can get most of it and then review a little bit for the exam next week. Uh, so I won't put anything on the exam on SEM or on observed or parameters. We'll save that for the final, and we'll go back over that again. So we didn't, since our, we had our computer. I did complain bitterly about the computers, and apparently they are working on a solution. Um, whether we'll get that in our lifetimes, we'll see. Uh, but it uh, looks like there's a big $200,000 server that they could get for the whole system that would give you guys access to SPSS from anywhere. And it would log in and you could run SPSS from anywhere. So that would really, yeah, that would be great. Yeah. That would really be great. So we're pushing, of course the university has no money, but <laughs> they could take it out of something else. They raise tuition, they'll do it. Just, just kidding, just kidding. Okay. Incoming next year, I think they should start higher tuition. For them, right? For them. Yeah. Yeah. Suck it. Yeah. All right, let's just go back through logistic again because we really raced through it. Anybody see the icon for that? <laughs> They did a study where they looked at uh, obesity levels in, based on whether or not there were school lunches or not, whether they did healthy school lunches. So they, they did somewhat of a random study where they went into a variety of schools and they had government-supplied school lunches who were healthier and lower in calorie. That's yeah. yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, we had an NPR. Yeah. And then I think they used a BMI cutoff for obesity, right? So it's logistic. They're trying to see what kinds of things made the difference. Here's a good case. We'd like to know the odds ratios, right? So even just the odds ratio for um, government-sponsored school lunch versus normal lunches, uh, which are, you know, like uh, chicken nuggets in, in most schools these days. <clears throat> So if you do chicken nuggets versus something reasonably healthy, what's the odds ratio of that would be a useful thing to know. Is it four to one obesity, two to one, one point seven to one, those are kinds of things. Um, so which, what part of this do you want me to go over again with the slides? Should just go to some examples. We went through the basic ideas of it, how the, how the equation works, probably the best thing to do is just show you a, Output, which I think you have in that. I gave you some output in that uh, last time. Actually, let me do one for you. Takes 
So I'll do the one, the one we did last time was the finishing on time one. You have that data in front of you, and then you also have the uh, whiplash data, right? And hand up the last time. There was one we did pressure data. There's one? The pressure data, I think the right one in. There it is. For the logistic, that's it? This is the event part. And I'll give you maybe a hundred or two. Yeah, you have that one? You have that output? Yeah, okay. That's a real study that we published. So, the, so let, but let me show you the uh, on time data first. So just so you can see how to do it. Get this higher somehow. Where's those sandbags? Yeah, there must be a great new definition of sandbag. <laughs> Ooh, there. Close enough, huh? Okay, let me get that data. Okay, so to do logistic, you probably don't need to see very many of them, it's very easy to do. You just do analyze regression binary logistic. We're only going to do logistic with two outcome, with a dichotomous outcome. You can do it with more, but we're not going to do that. It's hard to interpret. The dependent is usually the dependent, which in this case is, I think, called on time. Somewhere. Just in. I think it's that one. Can you see in your output what the output? What the output? I didn't give you this one, huh? That's it. What's that called? Adjusted how far. I think that was what we call the outcome. And then here's all the possible ones. So we wanted to look at um, how much you enjoyed your dissertation. It might not be exactly the same output you would have, but you'll see expert of the chair, expertness of the chair, uh, chair's availability. And those are called covariates in SPSS for logistic. And if they're not, they're, they're just predictors. I don't know dissertation why. times is it too? This time, okay. Sometimes the names are different here than there. Chair Hours per week, I think that was the time. We'll just do with those for now. That's probably not quite the same as you have. What's the fourth one you have there? Uh, hours, hours FAC, I think it's called. It's hours with your chair or hours with faculty or something. Should be one called this time. I don't know where that's called. That's called. Hours per, oh, here it is, hours per week on dissertation. Under options, you want to choose the classification plots, Osmond and show goodness and fit. Just the first two and really nothing else we care about there. Um, then you can save, just like in regression, you can save a probability for each person. Let's go ahead and do that just to see it. In group membership, you don't have to do that, but just so you see it. <clears throat> Plus, it gives you residuals on standardized, studentized residuals. You can also do influence statistics like Cooks and Leverage, like we did in regression. 
talking to them today. And that's all you do. <clears throat> so it tells you how many cases there are, how many missing. You've got the output, so we don't need to worry about it. But if I pick the right one, you'll see. Just look at your output and go through it. First it does the default model with no predictors in. Just tells you how many on behind or ahead of schedule. Uh, then this this was where the enters come. So this chi square is the difference in the negative log likelihood from this step. First step, 
negative log likelihood, classification table, doesn't give you that one at that step, but then it goes to how much it changes here from the default model, and then it gives you those Nagelkirke R squares. This is the goodness of fit measure that you want not to be significant. There's the final classification table, hit rates. We're going to go through those a little bit later, especially. And then the output is the uh, B weights, the standard errors of B weights gives you a chi square statistic called wall statistic. And these, the only significant one was chair expertise. And we've got a two point. It's not the same data you've got, or is it? I think we have slightly different variables. 2.209 for sure. Yeah, also close enough. So that one would be the important one. That's for every one unit of change in your expertise, you double your chances of finishing on time, <clears throat> holding constant, how much you enjoyed the topic, um, chairs availability, how much time you spent with the chair, how much time you spent per week on dissertation, all those things held constant and be the, well, the odds ratio. You got that? We double what? It would double your chance, your odds, your chances of finishing on time double, two to one. Or you could do it if you subtract one from that one, you could say that's 152% more likely to finish on time. So for the for the number for the odds ratio, you subtract one from it, and then that becomes a percentage. So like 152 percent. If I subtract one from the 2.152, you, you got slightly different numbers. But what what is your odds ratio for chair expertise? 2.29. 2.29. So it'd be 129 percent more likely. Or 120. 2.202. 121% more likely. Sure. <clears throat> okay. So what's the difference between the B having a one minute increase? You don't use the Bs. The Bs are, are uh, lo logits. They're, lo they're log numbers. So they don't make any sense. Oh, okay. They don't make any sense by themselves. So that's why you have to use the odds ratio to really make any sense out of what that means. Okay. Yeah. So that's what you want to do. Now I'll show you in a minute. If you get a negative, if you get a negative number here, then you're going to get an odds ratio less than one. Those are hard to interpret. <clears throat> so all you do is go back to the B weight and take the anti natural log of anti-weight, an anti-log of the natural, the, the anti-natural log of this B weight without the negative sign on it, and then it'll turn it to a positive number above one. I'll have one for you in a second, you'll be able to see it in the next one. So, for chair expertise, you're 220% more likely to finish on time for every unit that goes up? Yes. Yes. Makes sense. <clears throat> With everything else all constant. Now, if we wanted to see how much that did by itself, we would have to put it in by itself. Now, there's one other trick to this. There is a distortion. For any of these B weights that get larger, there is somewhat of a distortion in the standard errors because of the chi-square distribution, which is a skewed distribution, doesn't quite fit. So there is a little bit of distortion, <clears throat> and what you, what you, here's the trick that you can do to get around that in case you get that. Uh, I'll do it for you. What, you're, what we're going to do is I'm going to put in chair expertise as a, in a separate step from the previous one. So I'm going to go back and reset this. And I'll put next, and I'll put chair back to expertise back in again. <clears throat> so it'll do it in two separate steps. 
And when you do that, here's what you get. You get <clears throat> step one is the model without your expertise in there. Okay, and then step two. Far enough to that? There it goes, sorry. So step one is the model without share expertise, right? And then we'll put in. So here, notice that here we get a little bit different number for step and for model. So this tests the significance of that particular variable in the in step. In other words, so the significance was 0 0.004 for chair expertise just by itself added into it. And notice the significance wasn't quite that for it up here. Chair expertise, 0 0.008. So it got us a slightly different. This one isn't so bad, but sometimes you're going to get B weights that are bigger. And you can, if you want to get the more accurate one, make sure you do it in two different steps. That step difference doesn't distort the standard errors. So it, it's looking at the log, log, negative log linear, linear difference between step one and step two. That's not distorted the way the wall statistic is. So is that when you do it in a separate step, you're not holding the other ones constant? Is that the difference? Uh, no, it's everything in with those there. And then you put this one in addition to that. Final step, everything looks exactly the same in the final step as it did here in terms of the, these numbers, except you get that additional information of how much did that one step add to the equation. And the significance of that step will be very accurate if you do it in a step versus using this statistic here. So it tells you, holding your constant, how much did actually putting in chair expertise add? Exactly. <clears throat> exactly. And you can do blocks if you want or steps. You put a couple in together, or you can do steps. But for this trick, you want to do it with steps to just correct for the distortion in the wall statistic. A little additional complication. All right, let's look at the other data, which is more dramatic and has some negatives as well. So this was a study, I think the health students have heard this one before, but this is a study we did looking at uh, the intervention of a, a videotape in emergency rooms for people after an acute whiplash injury. I <coughs> want to tell me exactly what variables. <coughs> in our data, we have a different data set than that one. Or at least it's named differently. Oh, yeah, it doesn't. I think, it, I think it's the same. <coughs> I think it, as long as I put the same variables in, you'll get a similar output. Yeah. First, let me just show you, if you wanted to do a chi-score between two dichotomous variables here, like group and um, gender, remember I showed you how to do the chi-score last time without the full data set. It's easier than with this one, you just do descriptive statistics, cross tabs, say group and gender, and just be sure and tell it you want a chi-square. You get, in this case, we're glad to have a non significant chi square, right? Because we want the two, the two groups to be equivalent. So, this was a study with about 120 some subjects, 26 subjects. Half of them were assigned to a, uh, a video explaining how whiplash is based on muscle function. Half of them were just treatment as usual. And then we followed them up for three months, six months. In this case, we're going to look specifically at the six-month mark <clears throat> for who's taking narcotics or not. So we're going to put in a bunch of uh, co covariates, and then we're going to put in the group, and then we're going to see who was taking narcotics in six months for their neck pain. That's going to be the outcome. Okay. And I, I don't remember what variables you have to tell me from your output, which ones to put in. So everybody understand about this? And one other point about the chi-square. If any cell in the chi-square is less than five, the chi-square is distorted. You may vaguely remember this from undergraduate. So you need to do a, a, a correction for this, which is called the Yates correction for, for low sample size. 
It only works on only works on two by two. So there's less than five participants. Yeah. If, any, if, if any cell has less than five, then the chi square tends to be distortedly high. So what you do is, uh, if you're using the formula, what you do is observed minus expected absolute value of that minus 0.5 over expected this quantity squared some of that the same as like when I did it by hand let me do it but it's a pain to do it by hand so you have to get the uh, you get the correction in SPSS if there's fewer than that and it gives you a, a correction just reminded me because I just am the fourth on a dissertation where somebody had um, <coughs> Two groups. She's doing a um, comparison of a intervention for uh, foster children, <clears throat> and there's an intervention called the three five seven intervention, which somebody, some social worker in Pennsylvania that she knows, has done some stuff on, which kind of works on uh, object permanence skills for kids in foster care who don't get consistent uh, parenting care and focuses more on those kinds of issues than, and, and as she compared that to CBT and to treatment as usual in three groups of foster kids. So in terms of um, previous foster placements, she did a chi-square to see if the groups were equivalent in previous foster placements, which could be important, and came out with a significant chi-square. But the reason for it was is because some of them only had one or two in the cell. So if you do the correction, that, that's no longer significant. So she'll be, she doesn't know this yet, but she'll be very happy when I tell her this in, in the defense. So that she really doesn't have to worry about that non-equivalence now for that for an important variable, otherwise she would have to worry about it. So just remember, if you have very low cell sizes in any cell, that you've got to do something about it. Called the Yates what? Yates correction for uh, just called the Yates correction. Okay, so what did I do here? That was cross tabs. And so now we're going to do the logistic, and the dependent variable is the six-month narcotic level. What's it called? Can you see there? Narc probably or something. Narc three, probably narc three. Yes or no, where you're taking narcotics at the six month mark after we followed up on it. And which predictors do we put in? Psychiatric history, I know group is one of them. Tell me, you can tell what, what covariates were in that model? You can just look at the look at the final pump and be able to tell. Okay, hang on. H top H gender C G of G I know group's gonna be in there, gender's gonna be in there, psych Was psychiatric history, I think what that one was. Anything else? And there's the narcotic. And what? Narcotic. 
was in the covariates too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Narcotic. Really? Oh, a narcotic. Just because that's whether they whether they previously had taken narcotics. That's right. That it? I think so. Okay. So usual. Click. 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 We want to save Okay. <clears throat> so here's the step, very significant overall model. A uh, Nagel Kirky is about 49% of the variance accounted for. This was these were very startling results that we actually got on this one. Here you can see this chi-score is not at all significant, and that's really good because these the expected and observed match really nicely. That would be like the homoscedasticity looking for a mismatch in some particular decile for one of the groups or the others. Did I get that one? It's close though, right? No. no. What do you have? One at one nine three. So one nine point for the significance? Point for the nine over Oh. Okay. I don't know which one, which model, which so, yeah, I might have just used some different variables, but you also put in group, we don't have group. Oh, you don't have group yet, so the first model is without group. Yeah. Um so the variable curfew over it tends to tell you the yeah. yeah. All right. So what I did is I I must I did do it two steps on that one. I think I did actually just to do that all at one time. Group group must be in the second step. We take group out of there. Do it again. Let's see if we get the same numbers you have now. There we go. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> okay. So now we just we do have a significant model without group, but it's barely significant. So significant. Nagelkirchy means about 19% of the variance in whether or not they're taking narcotics is explained by those variables in the, in the equation. They get the same number. It's 698 for the Osborne Lip Show. Yeah. Okay, so that's still a good fit. So the way this works is for all the people who were taking narcotics, who were not taking narcotics, versus those who were. Divide them into deciles by their predicted score. Right? You, you create that equation, that, that logic equation for that. Just leave it on the board. So create the logic equation for them. You get a probability from 0 to 1. Anybody above 5 is predicted to be in one group, below 5 is in the other group. Uh, so we have an actual predicted score for each person. Then those can be uh, divided up into tenths deciles. So you can have the, so this is the uh, 10 observed in this decile and the expected was 10.83. Here were 8 were observed and 6.436. So the discrepancy between those would mean something's gone wrong with the model. And the reason that might be useful is that if the model was somehow wrong and there was one of these categories or a couple of these categories that were way off from expected and uh, observed, that would give you a hint of where the problem was. So maybe it was the fifth decile, for people in the ninth decile maybe, where the model didn't work very well. Just like we would sort of see for homoscedasticity if it wasn't evenly across. Can we, do, can we do one as an example? Yes. Uh, no, I, I'd have to create a model that really didn't work to do that. How did they, how did they categorize it like decile? by the probability, by the predicted probability for each person. So then they divide them into two groups, and you know, you get, a, you get a continuous probability for everybody, so you can just divide those into tens. You can't do it exactly, that's why some of these are 10, some are 11, some are 9, they did their best to put them in deciles. So you want those two numbers close to each other? Exactly. So this one's pretty good. This one's good, so these chi-squares you want to be not significant. How, where's like, Mm -hmm. The cutoff, how different? Well, if this is if this is significant, if you had a significant Hosmer-Lemshaw, then you look to see where it might be. 
you, you wouldn't know how much different, but you would say, okay, this is the decile. So maybe people in the 10th decile, for some reason, were way off. That would give you some hint of where the, where the model went wrong. It rarely happens, but it could happen. These two. Decile is, is in the observed column. That's the decile. Well, those are both. Uh, basically, these are people based on their based on their equation. Remember that equation I gave you on the slide that came out with a probability score. Here, I'll show you those probability scores. Remember, I asked it to save. Asked it to save the. So for the first model anyway, these are the numbers that came up for each person. It saves the number that's the probability of those. I don't think those are the right numbers, but and then it puts them in deciles by those numbers. Just just kind of categorizes them. You wanted not significant. then basically, whoops, so this graph is, this is without group in it, so this was not a great fit, but it worked sort of. So this is the, the 0 0.5 is the cutoff, and these are the, everybody we predicted to be above 0 0.5, you can see here we didn't have very many. Uh, one symbols, one means that they were using narcotics, zero means they weren't. So there's a few people that we made mistakes on. We predicted they would be using them, even though they really weren't. Now let's put group in, because group makes a giant difference. whether or not you saw the video. It just so happened the, the way the video was coded. So what we want to do is use our calculators and take this number, 3.643, and get the log of that one. We'll leave the negative off of there so we can get that odds ratio to be a positive number. With me? So the natural log? The natural log. We want the anti-log, so you do the shift first, right? Shift. So Exponent. Yeah, the exponent on here is right. 3.643. 38, I think I've written it out there, 38.21. Yeah. Now that's much easier to interpret, right? That means if you saw the video, your chances were didn't see the video, your chances were 
38 point something to one of using narcotics at the six month mark. We were 38 times more likely to use narcotics at the six month mark if you didn't see the video. If you didn't? If you did not. How do you know which one it is? Because it's a negative, well, you have to know how you coded it, one zero, so oh, okay. you got to remember how you coded it. I purposely coded it the wrong way so you could see what negatives were like. So if we, if we did it the other way, we coded one as seeing the video and zero as not seeing them, it would have just come out that way to start with. Okay. 382 So you can... Yeah, so if it's a negative sign, then you just change your wording to less likely. Can you repeat what it means again? Yeah, so for the holding constant, age, gender, psychiatric history, and previous narcotic use, if you did if you did not see the video, you were 38 point something times more likely to be using narcotics at the six month mark for your neck pain. It's a lot. That's a big or you can do it the other way. If you did see the video, you're 38 times more likely right. not to use the cards. You can do it either way you want. Okay. 38 times more likely to not use after seeing the video. Right. Uh, how come you didn't do any of these calculations on the last one before you put it through? Oh, well, uh, we could have for gender. I just okay. didn't bother with it. Yeah, so let's do it for gender now. I, I may not have written them on there, but let's do it for gender. So how do we code gender? We have to look and see where males want. Whenever you do this, try and always be consistent. If you're going to do a 1, 2, or a 0, 1, always code one gender the same way so you never forget how it works. I don't remember how I did it, so let's look. I think... Gender, one is male, let's see, one is male, two is female. Okay. I've got, I always code females higher because I have two daughters and a wife. I, I, know, I know where my breath's butter. So, so female gender is the two. Really? Wait, what are the studies saying? If you watch the video, you're going to no, no, it's less. It's less. less. Yeah. The so when video. it's negative, you're going to say the opposite. Exactly. If you watch the video, you're more likely. Right. Or, or if you didn't, you can either change it to watch or didn't watch, or to less or more likely, whichever one you want. Okay. They go the opposite way if you're doing that. So for gender, somebody do the calculations for 2.544. 12.73. 12.73. Okay, so females, holding constant, which group they were in, holding constant, their narcotic history, everything else held constant, were 12.73 times uh, less likely to use narcotics at the six month mark. So it's negative, so we know that we have to switch over to the other one. Can you say that one more time? So yeah, so because this is negative, remember females are two, males are one, right? So going up from one to two means that you're less likely to use narcotics, right? With everything else held constant. So females were 12.73 times less likely to use narcotics at the six month mark, independent of their group, independent of their age, or any of the variables. Because I coded females two and males one, right? So going, so we know that going up on gender from one to two makes you less likely to use narcotics because it's a negative number. So, like, is that like the one unit increase in gender? Yeah, because the dichotomous of one unit is just switching from male to female. Oh. <clears throat> so let's just take psych. 1.392. Yeah, so how do we get the percentage for a positive number? So for that one, we don't have to do anything. We just use this one, okay, but, but it's not significant. 
wall. So even though it's a good size odds ratio, we have to have a significant wall to really interpret. Okay. So we would just say, you know, for yes. one unit increase, even though it's not significant, yeah, uh, we would get four, or it would be 40% or 400%? Uh, 400, uh, 300%. Subtract one from it. Subtract one from it. Yeah. I'm not clear how much you know Hang on two seconds. Uh, so, this in this step, you added in group, but on our output, we do not have it. We don't have group? Yeah, yeah, the second page, I think I put it in. Oh, the second page. Well, on the first one, when we did put it in, uh -huh. um, we could have done these same calculations for the ones that were significant. Sure. Right? Like, there's no reason. Sure, absolutely. Okay. So, without group, though, we weren't really very interested in those without group. Right, right. I'm not going to search around if you want to see the you don't know. I, I looked at the data. Oh. I looked at my uh, variable variable file, and I said I saw that I coded females two and males one. It doesn't make any difference when you're looking at the. Well, you have to know that ahead of time when you look at this. If I coded them the opposite, then that negative number would have meant the opposite thing. Just make sure you know how you code the dichotomous measures and have it in mind. But would it be also that males are well? Uh huh. Yeah, absolutely. Females are less likely. Yeah. Because I think what's getting me is because you're going one unit up for twelve point seven three, right? One unit up just changing from male to female. That's all a unit means for a dichotomous measure. Yeah, I think that's what's getting me. It's not a conceptual number. It's a dummy. Yeah, but it's so, still changing by that one number. That's changing from one category to another. For, the, for when they're just dummy coded, or they're not, that's not dummy coded, it's just dichotomous measures. I mean, they could be dummy coded. But. So for a, one, for a one zero or a one two or a thousand and one and a thousand, whatever that might be, two, just two codes, it's always just changing categories is what that means. So there's a 12.73 times more likely that females are less likely to use in your female. Correct. With everything else on the constant. So if you were to double code females as a one and the males as a two, would that number be positive or yes. would it be completely different? Yes, no, be completely it's exactly the same, just be a positive number. Okay. Exactly. That's, that's. So it's important that when you do code them that you put them in your in your variable view, that you you list how you code them. It'll change your conclusions hundred <laughs> percent. And the same thing works with the group one, and that's also Exactly, you gotta need it. you gotta know how you put it. Right. right. Any variables that are that way. And same for psychi for psychiatric history. Assuming one means you did have one zero you didn't. But it wouldn't work for age because that's not but age you don't have to worry about because it's a real continuous measure, so you know that a one unit change in age, one year change in age, it's not significant, but it would be if it were significant. If it were significant, it would be a one year gives a point nine 1.009 to 1 chance of using narcotics. For every one year older, you would use some infinitesimally small odds of using more narcotics. It's not reliable, so you can't really say anything. So, can you only do the natural <coughs> law change on something that's dichotomous? No, 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 you can in anything. So, here's a negative, well, we don't have any here. But if you had a negative if continuous negative. measure, you just do the same exact thing. Do the same thing. That way you don't have to try to interpret a 0 0.026 odds ratio. To me, that doesn't mean anything. I know what 10 to 1 means. I know what 38 to 1 means. I know what 2 to 1 means. I don't know what 0.26 to 1 means. So I think it's always worth changing around so that you can make sense of it. So that number that we got, 4.73, that's now our new odds ratio for? Yeah, if you change the sign. Yeah, that would be the answer. And you, if you want to, if you, if you suspect that ahead of time that females are going to use it less, you could have coded them differently. So you don't have to worry about making that change. Well, you can just make up your own mind how you do it. But usually, I mean, whatever your coding system is, you should sort of leave it the same. For so, you, so you remember anyway. Now here we can see on, the, on this observed and predicted probabilities that Still, we did much better predicting people not using narcotics. 
right? So the mistakes over here are the zero, are the ones. One, two, three, four, five, six. Each symbol represents two cases. So 12 people we misclassified, right? You can see that there's the point five. And the ones that we said one for, these were supposed to be zeros. They were not supposed to be using it. <coughs> these guys we said zero for, all the zero zeros are right, but the ones are the ones who end up using narcotics that we didn't think would. But there's not a ton of mistakes in there, and you can see it better in classification table. So I guess there were 13 people in the count, right? Right, so, so here we go with, a, with classification table stuff. Now we're going to do some ROC curves on this one. So we're for dumb logistics, sort of. So that's 77 people that we said would not be using, we predicted would not be using narcotics, who actually didn't. And there's 13 people who we thought would be using it who actually were. These are seven people who we said would, would be using narcotics who actually weren't. And seven, four people, I'm sorry, four people. And seven people who we said would not be using who actually were. So those are our mistakes. Hit rate is 77 plus 13 divided by 126, I think is the total. 89% hit rate. <clears throat> then we have to decide which are false positives and which are false negatives based on however we code them. People do it differently. So what do you think? <clears throat> what, do we want to, what do we want to call these four people? These are people that we said would be using who weren't. So those I think we would call false positives. And then these seven would be false negatives. These four people, we, we predicted they'd be using narcotics, but they actually didn't use them in six months. So false positives, because we made a positive prediction and it was false. These guys we predicted wouldn't be using, and they were, so those are false negatives. We predicted negative, and they, we were wrong. And the four is the false positive, not the 79? Four is the false positive, seven is the false negative. And the 13 is the true positive. 13 of the true positives and 77 of the true negatives. So the trouble is everybody uses the order of these a little differently, like Dr. Mono, I guess, did it a little differently than this. Yeah, but you have to get used to it. Just make sure you know what they are because this is the this is the way SPSS does it. So, so one, the one means that you did they're not going to use over here, the one the one means they did use it. Zero means they didn't use it. One means they did use. One means they did use. Zero means they didn't use. And one over here, one means we predicted they'd use, and zero means we predicted they wouldn't use. Okay. Yes. One means yes, they're going to use. Right. So it's a false positive <coughs> because we said. They're used, but they did not. Correct. Yeah. So the, the false and the and the true has to do with your prediction. And then the second number is did they or didn't. Okay, so then we're gonna use that to do sensitivity and specificity too. So a particular test or study, that's the probability of finding a, a true positive that's really there. What's your chances of finding if it's really there? And, uh, um, specificity is what's the chance of rejecting it if it's not there? <clears throat> it's just like type one and type two error. So what you'd like in a given in a given uh, procedure test assessment, you want the highest possible combination of sensitivity and specificity, right? A really sensitive test with poor specificity is the guy that comes to your house to check for radon and uh, any little trace of anything show, shows up as a, as a positive and he says, yeah, well, your house is terribly um, contaminated. And you say, well, what's the chance of rejecting it if it's not there? And so, oh, it's terrible. I can, almost everything shows up as a radon blip here, <clears throat> right? 
And this came up especially during the Cold War when we had something called the Dew Line. We had all these poor military people sitting in um, northern Canada in a big radar line looking for Soviet missiles coming over uh, because we wanted as early warning as possible so we could all be incinerated knowing what was going to happen when the missiles came in. So they sat looking at blips on radar screens. So false positives were a problem, but false, you know, so, so here's the balance between sensitivity and specificity. You can have a really sensitive test so that every little swan flying over the North Pole gets seen as an IC, ICBM missile, and we would be evacuating kids in Chicago 12 times a day. Right? That's probably not a good solution. Um, on the other hand, if you don't find the missile when it comes, that's a real bad solution because then we get incinerated without being able to get our dog tags on. Um, specificity would be knowing, I mean, one specificity is saying we know it's not a missile when it's really not one. So if we had a really accurate test, we would know both things and that would be good. So think about medical tests. There's two, there's, uh, two famous ones, um, one for males, one for females, what are they? Where sensitivity and specificity are a big issue. Pregnancy tests? No, no, no pregnancy tests. Nowadays, pregnancy tests have very good sensitivity and specificity, right? Yeah, so mammograms. Right? Mammograms are the big one now. So mammograms are very sensitive, they're not very specific. Right? So mammograms show up a lot of lumps, a lot of dense tissue in the breast. Lots of things show up as an alarm in a mammogram that turn out not to be cancer. So then what does that lead to? That leads to a lot of unnecessary biopsies, <clears throat> um, which have a certain uh, danger to them. Some biopsies go wrong, plus they're expensive, and, and plus uh, they, the patient is scared to death <clears throat> until they get the result. So if you could get better specificity, that would mean that an alarm from a, from a, a mammogram would not only be sensitive to picking up a tumor, but it would reject non-tumors. So they're getting much better at that with much better ultrasound. So now sensitivity specificity is getting better and better with better technology. Now they have very high resolution ultrasound that can tell you much more likely when it's not really a tumor. And that's what, what you, that's what you'd be striving for for the assessment. <clears throat> for a man, the, the comparable one is PSA. Um, so this is prostate-specific antigen. This is a blood level measure which is really sensitive to anything. Little infections, you've got a little tooth infection, it shows up. Um, if you have an enlarged prostate, it shows up. Uh, and if you have prostate cancer, it shows up. <clears throat> but it's very poor specificity. And, what it, and if you get a high PSA, you can either do watchful waiting, which is not such a bad thing, or you can do a biopsy, which I've had one. It's not fun. <clears throat> so then, well, that's where they go in and actually take 12 samples of your prostate and process it. So it turns out when you do those biopsies, you get a lot of false positives. Lots of times the PSA is high, the person doesn't have cancer. <clears throat> and that leads to often treatment that's not needed, leads to false alarms, lots of stuff that's not good. So now the recommendation is actually, because they don't have a much better test, is to just look for prostate uh, vectors where the prostate goes, you get, so now what, um, in my age group, I go, I give blood whenever I go my, my physical, they do the, the, my PSA, but they chart it every year. And what they're now looking for is a big spike compared to that that's not explained by infection. And that's a much better, that is much better specificity. It's still not good, but it's better. So now the recommendation is don't, don't uh, get a PSA, but just put it in the chart. Don't be alarmed if it's like 4.5, cutoff is 3.6. Uh, but if one year it's, if it's 4.5, 4.4, 4.6, .4, and one year it's 42, then you better go and get it. <clears throat> so that would get a change to the specific thing that will do that. Okay, another way you can do that <clears throat> is, and this comes up in a psychological assessment sometimes, is something called a receiver operating characteristic curve.
the raw material for these curves is basically what you see in your classification table with a little bit more data than that. These, this is a way of dealing with sensitivity and specificity, but we're going to do it a little bit differently with these curves. Uh, so sensitivity, as we said, probably finding something that's really there. Sensitive test, one that almost always detects the disease. Very sensitive test is uh, for strep. You get a swab of your throat for strep throat. It's hardly ever wrong. It's almost always right. Very good sensitivity and specificity. Uh, specificity, eliminating something that isn't there, examine a certain eliminate possibility, struct would be a good example of that. Um, <clears throat> so, troop, if we, if we, here I'm switching them around again the way Dr. Mono does, because I like that way better, but that's not how SPSS does it, you've got to get used to it. So this would be true positives, true negatives, false positives, false negatives. Um, false positive would be similar to type one error, too gullible, it's, you think everything is something that it really isn't. Uh, false negatives are too skeptical, you reject everything that's because you don't think it's real. Um, sensitivity is true positives divided by true positives over false negatives. All right, so true positives divided by true positives plus false negatives. So it's a percentage of in this column. And specificity is true negatives divided by true negatives plus false positives, percentage in that column. There is a little bit of a rule of thumb that if you add up um, sensitivity plus specificity minus one, you get those numbers and you get a minus one. That, that's an index that runs from minus one to plus one. And plus one would be perfect. Minus one would be the worst. Uh, and it's kind of an index that you can use. Anything above zero is kind of in the, in the positive direction. What you're trying to do is optimize those two things, right? Yeah, so there's this little index, um, what's the guy's name? Um, I don't know. Oh, yeah, Yowden's, Yowden's index. Yowden's index. Or you can just take the sensitivity, which will be like a percentage, plus the specificity, minus one. <clears throat> and anything that's the more positive, the better, right? So if you had 90% sensitivity, 90% 90 specificity, minus 1 would be, you know, 180 minus 1 would be 80, positive 80 would be a good index. And but, but if you had good sensitivity, you had 90% specificity, sensitivity, but only 10% specificity, <clears throat> you'd get 90, let's say 90 plus 10 is 100, minus 1 is 0, so that would not be as good. Right? So it's just sort of a way of putting them together that Yowden has published some norms on it and stuff like that. It's somewhat of a judgment call on your part, what, what you want for that anyway. Isn't it though, like, as your sensitivity goes up, you can use specificity? If everything else held constant, but, but you know, like a, strep, like a test for strep, where there's very good separation between the two. So, so the first thing it depends on is how different are the two curves, right? And this is everybody who had a positive strep test, this is everyone with a negative strep test, and there's no overlap between them. Then 
it's true that if you manipulate sensitivities and best sit within the model, they'll, they'll alternate. But they're both going to be really high here, just because the two tests are so separate. Now, usually we're not going to get that, so we're going to have to decide with overlapping curves, where do you want to draw that line? And of course, there it's just like with type 1 and type 2 error. The more you move it to one, the other one changes, and, and it's always a trade-off. Listen, I think with the example of the learning like model, that was in like if you're discussing a cutoff criteria, if you're shifting the cutoff criteria, then you are going to have a kind of relation. Yes. But if you're using different samples or something else, they're more discrete, like you said. Yeah, if you get a better yeah. test, yeah. if you get a better test. So the better the test, the more the curves are separated, the less that's a problem. But it's always, once, once that's set, though, then it's always a trade off. <clears throat> So what you can do is you can create a curve called a receiver operating characteristic curve. These actually came out of that radar studies I was telling you about, where they brought in information scientists to the military to try and figure out where do we want to where do we want to pull the alarm button when those when we see a blip on the screen, and we wanted to optimize the two. So what they did is they did um, a bunch of tests on the radar screens where they put things that really were missiles and things that were false not missiles for thousands of guys created these curves. The way the curves work is you put sensitivity on the y-axis from 0 to 1. And you don't put specificity, you put 1 minus specificity, which is false positives on the x-axis. Right? So it's a little different because otherwise they would, the curve wouldn't work the way it wants to work. So these mean, this means more false positives, and this means higher sensitivity. <clears throat> the diagonal line means chance, chance findings. You flip a coin doesn't make any difference. You're not doing any better than you would by chance in making your. So anywhere in the cutoff on, the, on that line doesn't really help you at all. <clears throat> when you get a curves like these curves, that's much better than chance. And what you do is you, you know, the computer calculates the area under the curve, the AUC. The higher the area under the curve, the better your cutoffs are going to be, the better you're going to be able to make cutoff decisions. And then what you can do is look here to see where do you want to maximize depending on what you want to do. Sometimes sensitivity is much more important. When there's no cost to finding something, you want to have very high sensitivity, and specificity isn't so important to you. So essentially, it's a completely free, there's no, there's no consequences of a false alarm <clears throat> or a false positive, then why not have as much sensitivity as you can? Um, but often that's not true, so then you have to kind of decide how you're going to maximize the, these false positives versus this one. So, you can kind of look at this curve, it tells you how good overall the, the receiver operating characteristics are, and where do you want to set your cutoff? Oops. So a couple other examples I'm going to put on your sheet here. That's it. That's it. So here's a couple of real ones that I found. <coughs> So this was a mammogram one, uh, comparing a new high-tech digital mammogram versus a conventional mammogram. And so remember, the diagonal would be here. Um, so these are this is this is the sensitivity. This is the false positive rate. And so the difference between those two lines, you can see there is some difference in area for those two lines. Uh, I can't remember if that's a significant difference or not, but the, the convention, the digital mammogram was slightly better at making the, the detection. I think that's this one than this one. Wait, the thicker or the thicker? The thicker one is the digital. This is a conventional one. And that's the, that's the area under the curve. Wait, so is the digital one less? No. The digital one is better. 
That's that one. Which one's better? The more area under the curve, the better. So the more it goes along here, the better it is. The closer it is to the diagonal, the worse it is. So it's better than that. That exactly. So now I think in this study was the question, is it worth the, the price? Mm -hmm. And I think the conclusion was probably not yet. Until the price comes down on digital mammograms, it doesn't give us that much better. So we also could decide where the cutoff would be, but you can see here there's definitely going to be tough trade-offs on cutoffs, right? Every time you want to, if you want to increase sensitivity, then you're going to be way over here with a lot of false positives. If you don't care about sensitivity, you'll have very few false positives, right? So this is the same kind of trade-off that we talked about before. And so this is used a lot of times to kind of decide on cutoff spot. Here's a really good one. <clears throat> uh, mammograms, radiologists reported 10 years. Uh, for, for young people, for 19, 10 to 19-year-old year, old, year years, so the squares, oh, this is how much experience do the radiologist have in, in, in interpreting mammograms. And you can see actually not that much difference. But in this particular one, they had really good, a really good area for the curve. And clearly the cutoff spot we want is going to be somewhere around here, right? That would be useful for kind of doing the cutoff. It does depend on how much false positives matter. So, for instance, the, the, here's how this comes up for a psychologist. You often have to make decisions on release from prison and probability of re-offending for sex offenders. Imagine the pressure. You're, in, you're a psychologist. You go into a setting with sex offenders, and they're, they've served some period of time. And now the court says, okay, we want a psychological judgment on what's the likelihood of this person will reoffend. Reoffending, let's say they're pedophiles. <clears throat> so reoffending means that some little kid's life's going to be ruined if they reoffend. But it could be somebody that's in for statutory rape or something, and it's very unlikely to, to reoffend a, a, a child, and they're going to make them spend the rest of their life in jail because they had poor enough judgment to have sex with a 16 year old. That's what that's what you run into those extremes. Somebody who's a serial pedophilic, pedophilic, pedophiliac offender versus someone, some 19-year-old who had done, had poor judgment and had sex with a 16-year-old, and that's what the choices you're making. So now, then, so so the psychologists to do this have to use these ROC curves based on whatever data they have on the likelihood to reoffend, and the curves are not near as good as this. So they're based on whatever psychological tests they can use. Dr. Bigleyham does it with Rorschachs. Um, other people do it with other kinds of things. And so you get some very tough decisions on how to do it. Here's the some actual output on the data of an SPSS. Second, and this one was some data we found um, on the likelihood of um, having a psychotic break based on a quick, quick screening test. So these are people coming into a hospital setting. And it's important to predict whether they're going to have a psychotic break depending to determine the placement in the hospital. So they did a, a quick screening test of something that's designed that they thought might do it. Uh, staff rating after they've observed the person for a little while. They do an interview and they try to make an interview rating. And then this, that's the reference line. <clears throat> so you can see some of those were a lot better than others. Um, the lightest one was the interview rating. So the interview rating 
And the staff rating did much better than this quick, quick screening test, right? And if you look at the area under the curve, you can see the, oh, I got it wrong. This quick, quick, quick screening test was a 0.789. That was the highest one. So I got those lines wrong, I'm sorry. Staff rating was the worst, 0 0.603 and the interview rating was in between 0.774. The higher that number, the bigger the area of the curve, the better you're, uh, the better you're going to be able to do. It gives you a standard error, the significance of those. So the staff rating wasn't even significant. The other two were. It gives you a uh, confidence interval. Uh, confidence intervals in these curves, are it's not a normal curve, so they, they don't, they're not symmetrical. The lower end isn't exactly the same distance as the higher end from the average. So if you're wondering why 0.662 and 0.915, that 0.789 is not right in the middle, it's because it's an a, uh, asymptotic confidence interval, meaning it's not a normal curve. So that could be useful in the process of doing it. And then if you look at the cutoff points for each of these, you can see the sensitivity and false positives for each one of those. Um, <clears throat> the quick screening test only was a six-point scale, so you'd have to decide what was going to be your cutoff to decide whether you put someone in a padded room or not, <laughs> or give them, probably most likely, to give them heavy-duty antipsychotic meds, turn them into a zombie. Um, so you can see if we want really good sensitivity, 1.5, if they had, if they had 1.5, greater or equal to 1.5, we would definitely pick up sensitivity, but we have pretty terrible false positives. Oh, uh, well, no, actually, yeah, pretty terrible false positives. So if we're willing to go to a, like a 2.5, we get those false positives down to 0.296, 3.5 cutoff, lower sensitivity a, a bit, gives us way less false positives. Anything more than that, we get such terrible sensitivity that we wouldn't want to do something. So you want a high sensitivity and a high false positive, or a low, low false positive? Low false positive, yeah. So the, depending on how important it is, on, so now in this case, let's say the cost of medicating someone was pretty low. The cost of having a psychotic break on the normal ward might be very high, it might be very disrupt the whole ward. So then you want to go for sensitivity, less for false positives. On the other hand, if it's like if you're going to create tardive dyskinesia from somebody by giving them antipsychotics, that's a pretty big price to pay if you're making a mistake on someone who's not going to have a psychotic break. So you can see how it would work for any of those kinds of things. <laughs> Another example already. Maybe already. <clears throat> and here we have the P uh, PSA one. <clears throat> so the very last, the last one, <clears throat> PSA level and PSA V, which means the PSA vector or velocity to change in PSA. So the very last page. So those are some curves. You can see that actually both of them look pretty good in this particular case. Um, for men less than 50 years old, we did pretty well, especially for the um, actual PSA, <clears throat> but for younger men, not near as well, right? Uh, but for the vector, or velocity, I guess it is, um, oh, same thing for the velocity. It <clears throat> doesn't really kind of look like it, but it's all done in that little area. Can you show this up here to see what you see? Yeah, I don't have a slide that, sorry. So you see that the area of the curve is 0 0.872 for men younger than 50 years. See it? And then for, and it's 0 0.819 for men over 50 years. So that's the difference in our ability to use the PSA test <coughs> to detect uh, actual cancers, I guess. 
and I believe those little arrows are where the cutoffs are that the, uh, that the urologists use. They sort of look right, don't they? <coughs> so that little arrow then will represent a number like we saw in our previous graph. You can't see it on here exactly where the cutoff would be, but once you decide that, you can go back to your actual data and decide where the cutoff would be for each of the values. And that becomes the practical use. So then this goes, this gets published, and urologists around the country say the published norms are if you have above a four point something or other, we do biopsy, and if you're below, we don't do biopsy, or we do watchful waiting, or whatever the recommendations are. There's new recommendations for these coming out all the time. And if your doctor has got half a brain, they pay attention to those. If they don't have half a brain, they do it by the seat of their pants, which means they're going to make a lot of mistakes just based on their experience. So it's one of the reasons that our training for MDs is so terrible. They don't get any of this stuff. They have no idea what an ROC curve is or what um, these things mean, so you have to kind of educate them as you go. There is a move to try and do that, but most medical students couldn't care less about this stuff. It's a good thing for us, though, because if you're working in that setting, you get to be the person who tells them how this works. And they love it. Uh, and they realize that they have a big gap in their knowledge and they really want someone to understand statistics to help them. So the psychologists working in medical settings often get called on to help interpret output from the medical publications. In the publications themselves, in, in big academic medical schools, they always have a statistician hired to do all the statistics. And the docs never have to do it. But sometimes they're psychologists. One of our colleagues is one of those at the VA. So, kind of a fun job. Okay, see curves. That's it. Let's take a quick break.